Welcome to the Bio Bunker. It's Professor Carefit, and today we're going to talk about invertebrates. We're going to survey a few of the important ones anyway. We're uh, not going to get close to talking about them all. If you're into invertebrates, take the invertebrate zoology course later on in your biology career. Now, in the Cambrian, remember the Cambrian? Way back in the day, right after the uh, end of the pre-Cambrian, when we enter into the Paleozoic. The beginning of the Paleozoic is the Cambrian. The end is the Permian. So we end with a huge extinction, but we begin with something known as the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian Explosion is called that because it's an explosion of diversity. Now, there were, there were animals before the Cambrian Explosion, but right around the Cambrian Explosion, we see the evolution of hard parts like exoskeletons that fossilize really well, and we can really find a lot of fossils and see a lot of evolution happening very quickly around that time. So a few goals for this week. Uh, you're going to talk about what the uh, Cambrian explosion is. You're going to tell me, be able to tell me what an animal is. You're going to tell me uh, the traits of several animal phyla. And uh, towards the end, we're going to talk about arthropods. You're going to tell me why they were so successful at colonizing the earth and why they are the most successful phylum on the planet. And uh, I expect you'll be reading along with this, doing guided reading questions and fleshing out some of the ideas. I don't want to make these videos too long because I'll lose your attention. So read your book. All right, moving on. Here we are. The uh, cladogram here showing the invertebrates and the, and the vertebrates here, the chordates, of course. But we have a lot, most of critters on this planet, most of the animals are invertebrates, as you can see here. And right here at the Cambrian, let me turn on my fake laser pointer, the Cambrian explosion. So before the Cambrian, a few of these were around, like sponges and cnidarians and maybe some mollusks. But after the, right during the Cambrian uh, before, and before the Cambrian's over, all known phyla, write that down, all animal phyla existed by the end of the Cambrian, all of them, including some that are extinct. But all of the ones that are alive now were here by the Cambrian. That doesn't mean there were mammals, but we're talking about phyla, right? Like chordates, not vertebrates, but chordates, right? Huge explosion of life, lots of evolutionary uh, exploration and adaptation and innovation, and then some of them went extinct. So, what makes an animal? If I had to, you know, tell you to give me five things that makes an animal an animal, what would you say? Think about it for a moment, because it's important that you think about it, but you might have some ideas. Now, here's what I would say. They ingest food by a heterotrophy. They are multicellular. So let me let me step back. They ingest food, right? They don't digest it outside of themselves. They bring it in. They're multicellular. They don't have cell walls. They have active movement of some kind. They develop from embryos, fertilized eggs, uh, you know, zygotes that divide into embryos. Uh, they have tissues. And except for one. <laughs> uh, all right. So animals are all multicellular. Tissues don't actually evolve till after sponges. And then we have all these different traits, not all of which we're going to learn, but we are going to talk about several of the groups up here on, the clay, on, on this cladogram. They're all in your book, but we won't hit all of them today. All right, basic animal life cycle. Adults are diploid. They have sex. They are while well, they make gametes by meiosis. Gametes fuse uh, by fertilization, making a zygote, which grows into another adult. That's the basic animal life cycle. There are exceptions, but we won't hit those today. All right, so animals. First of all, we think they're monophyletic, meaning a true clade. They all descend from a common ancestor. Sponges are sister to all other groups, and some people argue they shouldn't be included in animals. Uh, but they, they're kind of between protist and animal, probably an animal, just a real basal animal. Um, now, the clade of animals with true tissues, where most of us are, are known as the eumetazoa. And within that clade, most animals are in the clade bilateria, meaning they have bilateral symmetry rather than, rather than radial symmetry. And within the bilateria, the most common group, the most abundant group, are, the, uh, are, um, are, are going to be the arthropods. Uh, but just to put it in perspective, when we compare all animals, most animals, 95% of known species, are one type of invertebrate or another something that does not have a backbone all right so the oldest known clade is phylum porifera 
write that down, Porifera, um, known from over 600 million years ago, uh, perhaps older, uh, has a loose body organization, no real true tissues. Um, so meaning it has lots of cell types, but they, they're not organized into tissues. And they live together in a skeletal matrix, the stuff that's secreted by the cells. And these are filter feeders. That stuff that's secreted by the cells, by the way, um, is the sponges you use when you buy an all natural sponge. Um, most of these are have no body symmetry. A few are a little bit radial. Um, larvae are free swimming. Uh, but adults, uh, I know that it's cut off here. Adults are sessile, meaning they're stuck in place. S-E-S-S-I-L-E. Sessile, you can see the word on the top hat uh, version of the PowerPoint. So uh, they're just a weird animal, uh, very strange. They have a couple of cell types. Uh, they form these bodies uh, that have two major cell types that I'd like you to be familiar, familiar with. One is called a coanocyte. It looks like a cone almost, and it has a flagellum that whips around and they filter feed. And then the other cell type is an amoebocyte, and those can crawl around like an amoeba. And they act almost like the circulatory system. They don't pump blood around, but they crawl around moving food from one cell to another. So you can see food comes in via endocytosis into the coanocyte, then it's passed on to the amoebocyte. And that is the body of a sponge. Uh, that skeleton, the amoebocytes, and then one other structure that helps give rigidity to it, and those are these hard structures made out of like calcium carbonate called or silica, and they're called spicules. And those fossilize really well, which help us to know more about uh, the uh, uh, ancient history of sponges. But if you buy one at the store, you just get that, that kind of skeleton here uh, that you use to wash with. What's weird about a sponge, like I said, no true tissues. They regenerate really well. If you grind that thing up in a blender, the cells can kind of crawl back together and form a new sponge. It's kind of cool. Not instantly, but they can they can do that. So filter feeders, no tissues, no real body symmetry that we're going to worry about. So symmetry, as you might know, um, we saw we talked about it in the lab a little bit. Like things like hydra have radial symmetry, meaning kind of like a wheel. You can cut them in more than one direction and get equal sides. Whereas bilateral symmetry, like this uh, lobster or this uh, shovel, you can only cut that one way and have two equal sides. If you cut it the other way, lengthwise, you'll end up with a front end, you know, an anterior end and a posterior end. You won't have two equal sides. So that's bilateral symmetry. And, uh, you know, there's an example of radial again. There's an example of bilateral. When you have bilateral symmetry, then we have ventral, dorsal, posterior, and anterior sides, uh, like, like we talked about during dissection. All right, phylum Cnidaria. Phylum Cnidaria only has two layers of tissues, two layers. Everyone else we're going to talk about has three layers. Um, I'm not going to go into the terms ectoderm and endoderm, but they are in your book if you want to read about them. Um, but their body has two cell layers thick. It's an old group. They have radial symmetry and a gastrovascular cavity. And they have stinging cells in their tentacles called cnidocytes, hence the name cnidaria. And they uh, uh, sting their prey and bring it into the gastrovascular cavity and digest it. Now, this is going to include, uh, of course, the hydra, the jellyfish, as well as coral is in this group. And... Um, uh, sea anemones are in this group as well. Here's the basic body plan. There's two life, sti uh, life stages in some of these. Some of them are called polyps, like the hydra that are stuck in place. Uh, but in the jellyfish, they have a polyp stage and a medusa stage uh, where they kind of swim around and pulsate. They have muscles and a basic nervous system, and they just sort of pulsate and move around and eat whatever they can kind of accidentally catch things bump into them they sting fish and they eat them platyhelminthes we've seen these in the lab these are the flatworms they have a flat body increases their surface area to volume ratio they have a muscular pharynx which you should know about uh, that can come out it's the entrance to the gastrovascular cavity that they can eat with so they have a gastrovascular cavity they don't have a body cavity which is interesting meaning they don't have a, a cavity full of organs they just have a digestive gut, you know, a gut, a gastrovascular gut. 
they are marine, freshwater, and terrestrial. And many of them are free living, meaning they crawl around, but some of them are parasites. Tapeworms are in this group, and they can be up to 20 meters long. And flukes, which are a type of parasitic um, flatworm, also in this group. So they will not have a pharynx, a muscular pharynx to eat with, um, because they live inside of an organism. It's pretty cool. This group has a uh, brain-like structure, ganglia, which is just a collection of neurons near the head and eye spots to detect light. So we have now our first group that's bilateral, and they have eye spots at one end, which concentrates a lot of nerves near that front head, so the beginning of, a, of that front of the body, which means they have kind of a brain. Um, now, flatworms that are parasitic usually don't have eye spots because they live inside of critters. In fact, um, the uh, the uh, uh, tapeworms uh, are missing a lot of parts. <laughs> they don't they don't uh, have a digestive system. They don't have gastrovascular cavity in the case of a tapeworm because they live in digestive tracts. So t let's talk about tapeworms. We've seen planaria in lab. You can transfer that knowledge to this coming test. They have a muscular pharynx, eye spots. And they swim around. They actually have cilia that allow them to move around. But tapeworms lack a digestive system because they live in one. And they don't have a brain. They don't need one. You just latch on and eat whatever uh, your host is eating. They feed through absorption, through basic diffusion. And that's possible because they're flat. Surface area to volume ratios. They have a mouth part called a scolex that has claws or teeth on it that attach to the intestine. And then they have repeating structures known as proglottids that each one makes eggs and uh, those can break off and they can pass out of the organism in their digestive tract and then if, and then get eaten by another critter and then those eggs hatch and then the next critter is infected. If you've ever had a dog or cat with tapeworm, it'll look like little bits of rice in their poop and you know that their proglottids are breaking out and uh, that your dog's infected. Here's an image of a tapeworm. They can be really, really long. There's that hooks and sucker on the end. The proglottids are just these repeating segments. Um, and they can be up to 20 meters long. The longest one ever found was found in a whale. But they affect infect humans as well. But back in the day, you could uh, <laughs> you could buy these uh, health food stores, you know, natural food stores. Uh, you can buy them, swallow them, and they'll help you lose weight. Yeah, they will. They'll eat part of what you're eating, but uh, then you're infected with tapeworms. I just want to point out that just because drugstores sell things, drugstores sell homeopathic medicine. I'm going to rephrase that. They sell homeopathic garbage that they claim to be medicine, right? Don't buy something that's not backed by evidence. Um, in the same way, drugstores used to sell, look, look who made this bear. Like bear aspirin, this is bear heroin. You could buy that in the drugstore. Just because a store sells it doesn't mean it's real medicine or that it's a good idea. All right, mollusks. There are lots of different kinds of mollusks. We have uh, gastropods up here. We have cephalopods here, bivalves, right? So gastropods, cephalopods, and bivalves, we've talked about those already in lab. You're already familiar with those. I think you'll be able to pick those out uh, of a lineup. But just to remind you, gastropods crawl on their bellies. That means head foot. Cephalopods have tentacly heads, and then bivalves open like a clam. You can read about it in your book. But this group fossilizes well. Why? Because they have shells. In fact, fossil mother of pearl of these things makes really pretty jewelry. If you ever find it, it's called amylite. Pretty cool. Um, easily fossilized, ancient lineage, lots of uh, fossils from this group. This group, um, in the snails and others, and the squid, they have a, a tongue-like structure called a radula that has teeth. Uh, that are able to, uh, in this case, there are snails that use it to uh, scrape algae off rocks, or there are snails that burrow into other bi into bivalves, so they're cousins here, and then they eat the meat out of, of the bivalve uh, after they drill in with their radula. So there are predatory gastropods that use that radula. And as you already know, squid use it to uh, chew up their prey. What's neat is we can find fossils of this uh, kind of predation from way back in the Paleozoic, as you can see here. 
Bivalves have a hinge shell. Meep, meep. Have a bunch of eyes. Look at all those eyeballs right there. And uh, are often filter feeders or suspension feeders. And they can kind of move around by <laughs> doing that and, and uh, swimming, essentially. They are an animal. I mean, they're a weird animal, but they are absolutely an animal. And then the cephalopods. We've dissected one of these already. They are often quite intelligent, have eyes that are very similar to human eyes or vertebrate eyes, um, and uh, have arms or and or tentacles in one end and are predators. And they have a closed vascular system. Pretty cool. They also can be quite intelligent. Um, octopuses can be taught to open jars to get to food. The last major group of arthropod or of uh, inverts I just want to mention today are the arthropods. Arthropods are very ancient and uh, used to be, you know, represented mostly by uh, trilobites, but they're extinct now. Uh, but they're easily identified by their heavily segmented bodies and their jointed legs. Arthropod means uh, something along the lines of, of jointed feet or jointed legs. So two uh, two thirds of known identified species on the planet are arthropods. So the most successful phylum on earth by any measure uh, in both abundance and diversity. They have a segment. So there are reasons why they've been so successful. First of all, they evolved in the ocean, but they had an exoskeleton and they had legs, which meant they could crawl out of the water and colonize land really easily. They had a waterproof exo exoskeleton and they had legs already. Um, so Things that have helped to make them successful. One, they have a segmented body. Why would that help make you successful? Well, a lot of those segments can evolve differently and have specialized functions. Like some of them might be used for swimming while other, other parts are used to grab food. Or they might evolve um, wings so they can fly. Insects, right? So different segments can uh, evolve differently, making them highly specialized. And now in some groups, the segments are all the same. Think of a millipede. But in other groups, like insects, those segments can be quite different. They have jointed appendages, which means they can run fast. They can colonize land easily. Um, they, they can do all kinds of things. Uh, they're not real. They're, they're really mobile. You know, if their legs weren't jointed, they'd walk really funny. But those flexible, like having elbows, basically, you know, lets them really get around. And that exoskeleton that they have. That exoskeleton um, prevents dehydration and it's hard. It, it protects them from predators. That exoskeleton is um, made of chitin, um, just like the cell walls of fungus. I didn't mention that before, but you know it now. It could be on the test. The cell walls of fungus are made of chitin, just like the exoskeleton here, just like the pen of a mollusk also made of chitin. Pretty cool. So a very successful group. Here's a... Uh, Cambrian Ocean showing you all of these phyla that we have now existed back then. We'll talk about chordates in the next lecture. But this image I want to leave you with today. This shows you the diversity of life trees, you know, plants, birds, uh, mammals, fish, uh, insects. But the size of the organism shows you how diverse they are and how abundant they are. So how many of them there are. And notice we are far outnumbered by uh, insects than by anyone else. So notice mammals are represented by like an elk on here somewhere. Uh, let's see. There it is right there. Way more arthropods. There's something like a billion, billion arthropods on the planet. <laughs> There's a lot of them. All right. Um, that's a whirlwind. I'd hit this harder if we were in person in class, um, but uh, please review the file I talked about. Read those sections fully in the book, and um, we're going to move on to the chordates. Uh, then we'll move on to uh, just a lecture on the mammals, and after that, that'll be everything for exam three.